thank you. Shannon told me before that the, you guys have these talks to get exposed to uh, new kinds of learning outside your core competency, and this is probably about as far outside your core competency <laughs> as you're going to get. So I'm going to give a talk today about a theory about sexual desire that we describe in our book, Billion Wicked Thoughts, uh, written by me and my co-author, uh, Sai Gadam. He lives in India, so that's why he's not uh, here with me today. So I'm going to talk about our theory of sexual desire. I've always thought the best and most useful scientific theories are ones that explain diverse phenomena using a single simple theory. For example, atomic theory can explain why copper is heavier than helium, and it also can explain why copper conducts electricity better than helium. This is why uh, atomic theory is so powerful. It explains a diverse phenomena of electrical conductance and mass within a single theory. So I'm going to try to do the same thing today with our theory and show how our theory of sexual desire explains one of the most popular erotic interests for women and one of the most popular erotic interests for men. And uh, what we're going to use, <laughs> one of the most popular erotic interests for women is Edward Cullen, the vampire from the Twilight series of novels by Stephanie Meyer, also in the movies. I have the text behind him to emphasize that he's a textual character, a fictional, fictional character. And I'm also going to explain one of the most erotic, most popular erotic interests for men, which is shemale porn. You may or may not be surprised to hear that shemale porn is one of the most popular kinds of erotica for heterosexual men all around the world, in every country in the world. Uh, and it's favored by heterosexual men, not gay men. Gay men are not very interested at all in shemale porn. Uh, some bisexual men are interested, but it's definitely dominated by heterosexual men. So we're going to explain today how our theory shows uh, explains why heterosexual women like Edward Cullen and why heterosexual men like Shemil Horn. And at the end you can tell me if I was successful in persuading you or not. <laughs> so, who are we and what did we do? Uh, we're both, I and my collaborator, are both computational neuroscientists, which means we view the mind as software. Researchers in our field try to figure out the brain software behind higher functions of the brain, like language, memory, and vision, but we thought we would use the techniques and methods of computational neuroscience to try to figure out a lower function of the brain, sexual desire, which is something none of our colleagues had taken a look at yet, mainly because of its controversial and political nature. Um, and so we set out to try to figure out, okay, what's the most basic software of uh, the sexual brain in terms of how it processes sexual desire? To do so, we needed data. And we immediately realized there is a vast, untapped source of data about everyday people's sexual behaviors. And this is the internet. It turns out that nobody in the field of sex research had turned to the internet yet to try to use it to understand people's sexual interests and sexual behaviors. So we decided to use online data and combine that with findings from neuroscience, animal studies, psychology experiments, evolutionary theory. Combine all these together to try to come up with a model of sexual desire in men and women's brains. And you might be surprised to hear that the only systematic study by scientists of people's sexual desires was done more than a half century ago. That's Alfred Kinsey, his famous or notorious Kinsey reports. He surveyed about 18,000 people, mainly middle-aged Caucasians in uh, the American Northeast, and asked them face-to-face -face about their sexual interests. And this is the only scientific, systematic scientific attempt to try to figure out what do men and women actually like, what actually turns on men and women. And as you can imagine, most people are not very comfortable sharing their most intimate, private, sexual details uh, with a stranger. Uh, so until now, the only data we've had on what men and women have liked has been survey data. So online data uh, finally gives us an opportunity to see what people really are doing behind the anonymity of their laptops and desktops. And many of you here who are engineers probably already have a very good sense of, sense of that. So we try to gather as much online data as we could that would reveal, reveal something about people's sexual behavior. So we gathered web searches, search histories. Uh, we downloaded a million erotic stories, a half million erotic videos. We looked at online personal ads. Uh, OkCupid, the uh, online dating site, shared data on about six million users with us, all anonymous data. Um, a couple, oh, more than a couple. Uh, a number of porn sites uh, were kind enough to share some of their internal data with us. For example, Pornhub, which is, uh, I don't know if it is at this moment, but it's been the most popular adult video site uh, in the world. They shared some of their internal data. Uh, one of the most popular uh, porn sites for women shared, uh, shush.com, they shared their data. So we gathered all kinds of data, 
as much as we could, we looked at website traffic, uh, porn site subscriptions. Uh, one the biggest billing company for the porn industry, CC Bill, shared some data with us. So we tried to gather as much different kinds of online data as we could, all to try to figure out what do men and women really like. So as a result of our research, uh, we realized that some, there's something pretty profound about uh, the basic way that sexual desire works in the brain. So we're all born with a finite, hardwired set of taste cues. Sweet, salty, savory, bitter, and sour. We're all born with these. Each of these tastes, senses of taste, has a, its own neural subsystem, and it also has its own evolutionary function. For example, we all have a taste for sweetness. Sweetness detects sugar in our food, and sugar is our source of energy. So there's a neural subsystem supporting our sense of sweetness, and the reason we like things that are sweet is because it helps us identify if there's energy uh, in our food. It turns out, in analogous fashion, that we're all born with hardwired sexual cues. But unlike taste cues, men and women share the same taste cues. Men and women's sense of taste, uh, sense of sweetness, for example, is pretty much the same. Um, but men and women's sexual cues are very different. It's almost as if you gave uh, a man and woman a peanut brittle, and the man might report a sense of uh, a taste of saltiness, and the woman might report, uh, report a, uh, a taste of uh, sweetness. Uh, men and women respond to the same stimulus in different ways because they have uh, different cues. So our goal in our research was to try to identify the full range of biological cues, uh, and of course some biological cues are heavily shaped by culture, um, but to identify the full range of biological sexual cues in men and women. So let me tell you an, just a quick overview of the differences between male and female cues. Male sexual cues are primarily visual. That should come as no surprise to most people. Female sexual cues are primarily emotional and psychological. Now men do have psychological cues, but the men's psychological cues are usually quite different than women's psychological cues. Another basic difference is most male sexual cues are external. They're, they respond to what their partner is doing or what their partner looks like. Female sexual cues are both external, responding to the partner, but internal, they also have some internal cues. Uh, for example, a woman's feeling of safety, uh, if she's hungry, uh, if she feels desired, Internal feelings and internal physical states affect uh, female sexual arousal, but very rarely and to a very low extent affect uh, male sexual arousal. So let me describe some, give you some particular examples of male sexual cues. I'm not going to run through the whole range uh, right now. Uh, some of the most common and prevalent sexual cues for men are anatomical cues, parts of the body. And what we found from our research is that there are four parts of the body that men are interested in universally uh, in every co country we looked at, including uh, preliterate, unwired countries uh, as well. Four body parts that all heterosexual men uh, are interested in. It's breasts, butts, feet, and the fourth body part was a big surprise to us, something we completely didn't anticipate. It turns out uh, the fourth body part that heterosexual men are very interested in looking at is the penis. <laughs> 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 that was our reaction that first. But the, the data is pretty overwhelming. So men search for penises almost as often as they search for vaginas. If you look at all of the top uh, porn tube sites, these are erotic pornographic sites that are knockoffs of YouTube, they always have a category for large penis porn. Uh, we looked at the top 35,000 most popular adult sites in the world, and 1,000 of those 35,000 were devoted to large penises, heterosexual sites with large penises. Uh, devoted to men. Uh, eye tracking studies, they show images of clothed men and clothed women to men and women. The men look at the crotch of the man much more often than the women do. Uh, men are interested in penises, especially uh, large penises. <laughs> women are not so interested in the penis as the con congressman Wiener's recent scandal. <laughs> 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 In, we looked at romance novels and erotic stories. In romance novels, even erotic romance novels, the penis is rarely described, and when it is described, it's usually described in emotional terms, rarely in physical terms. When men write erotic stories, they always spend lavish detail describing the penis. <laughs> to the nearest half inch, to the nearest quarter inch, <laughs> the length, the girth, the veins, all of it. In male written erotica, you'll get every detail about what the penis looks like. In female erotica, 
rarely is much attention paid to it, though we did find one exception in romance novels, uh, which I wasn't familiar with until I started this research. Uh, when women describe uh, penis as a romance novel, they often describe it in terms of the blood, which me as a man was very strange. Just, the blood coursed through his penis, blood rocketed to his penis, his penis surged with blood. Uh, men do not think about their penis in terms of uh, the blood inside it, but evidently romance novels, uh, blood dominates uh, the descriptions of the penis. So these are four, uh, four body parts, uh, anatomical cues that seem to be, men seem to have a predisposition, a biological predisposition to paying attention to these. It's also interesting, we looked at gay porn and gay erotica as well, and, and gay sexuality. It turns out for gay men, these same four body parts are just as interesting to gay men. So all gay men uh, universally are interested in chests, butts, feet, and of course penises. Uh, as well. So the male sexual brain, gay or straight, seems to be interested in these four particular body parts. Uh, if we have time afterwards, I can explain why it is that these four particular body parts are so interesting uh, to men. Uh, go ahead. But where is the vagina in the top ten? So <laughs> <laughs> the vagina is interesting, but we had trouble. Anal we have trouble analyzing with the same specificity for two reasons. One is that the most common word for vagina. Uh, pussy is also slang for a woman in general, so it's hard to distinguish when the man's searching for hot pussy if he's searching for that particular body part or for women uh, in general. And also, all pornography shows uh, the vagina uh, in some form, close up or not, so it's very hard to distinguish, that, take that out and to identify is a man specifically interested just in the vagina or something else, so it's hard to gauge exactly the popularity of that. Uh, so that may be the most popular, we can't say, but the order of popularity, if you're curious, breasts are most popular, then penis, then butts, uh, then feet. Vagina's in there somewhere, probably near the top, but uh, it's very hard to tease apart and that's <laughs> interesting, that is an anatomical, anatomical part. So uh, these are some male cues. Let me talk about some female cues now. And again, I'm not gonna cover them all, just a few to give you a sense of it. Perhaps the most prominent and common female sexual cue is the confidence of a man. A man's social confidence, his leadership, uh, his dominance. Alpha males are very popular uh, in romance novels. In fact, uh, if you analyze the, uh, the incidents of heroes in romance novels, the 10 most popular heroes in romance novels are all alpha males. Kings, princes, doctors, sheriffs, generals, knights, all confident, strong leaders. Uh, another, uh, sexual cue for women, is a man's competence, his skills, his ability to get things done. For men, not so important. Whether a woman's a waitress or the CEO of Google, uh, doesn't make much difference in terms of sexual arousal. But whether a man's a waiter or the CEO of Google does make a difference to many women's uh, sexual attraction to, to him. Uh, another fundamental difference between male and female cues, for men, going on to online erotic sites is a solitary enterprise. Men don't typically talk about uh, their erotic experiences online with other men. And if they hear about their friends' interests uh, online, that does not influence what they look at or what they're interested in. Knowing that your buddy likes uh, porn star Jenna Jameson or Stoya will not influence your uh, opinion of whether they're attractive or not. This is not the case with women. Women are influenced by the opinions of other women. Women seek out the opinions of other women in erotic uh, content and erotic opinions, uh, as well as relationship opinions, of course. The most popular erotic community for women online is the fan fiction community. Uh, if you're not familiar with fan fiction, this is an online community. It did exist before the internet, but it absolutely exploded uh, on the internet. Um, it's a community dominated by women, and it, contain, it consists of amateur authors who write stories about popular books, characters in popular books movies and TV shows. For example, the most popular kind of fan fiction is Harry Potter fan fiction, uh, followed close behind by Twilight. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer used to be one of the most popular uh, uh, fandoms in fan fiction, Lord of the Rings. Uh, just about any TV show, uh, movie, uh, book, even there's fan fiction about bands, about uh, professional wrestlers, just about anything, but dominated heavily uh, by books. Um, so in the fan fiction community, women write stories about the characters or the settings uh, of these fandoms. Uh, it's not always romantic or erotic, but the vast majority of the stories in fan fiction are romantic and erotic. 
So an amateur woman will write a story, post it online, and then there'll be discussion. People comment on the story. They talk about it. They talk about what turned them on in the story, whether the story was authentic or not, whether the emotions were authentic or not, the characters were valid. And the talking goes back and forth. It could be long dialogues, hundreds and hundreds of comments uh, about stories. And in fact, there's even a part of fan fiction called Meta, which is talking about the process of talking about stories. <laughs> <laughs> so women, for women, erotica is a, a social enterprise. For men, it's a solitary enterprise. And women respond to other women's opinion of a guy. The more women that are attracted to a man increases the attraction <coughs> of that man. So the phrase, the best men are always taken, is doubly true. If a man is taken, by definition, he's more attractive and appealing. If a man's alone and isolated and solitary and nobody's interested in him, that will reduce his appeal just by virtue of not being taken. So, uh, I think if there's any other female sexual cues I should cover, that's probably good enough for now. I can talk more, add some more later. So, these are some of the cues, there's many more. Let me talk about how the differences between the male and female brain process these cues. So the male sexual brain responds to any single sexual stimulus. If a computer engineer was designing the male sexual brain, he would use an OR beat because any single stimulus will turn on uh, a man, whether he sees a nice chest or a sexy older woman walking by, or if he's a fan of a BBW or BBW image, any single stimulus will trigger arousal. And the female sexual brain does not work that way. The female sexual brain, if it was designed by a computer engineer, would be an AND gate. Female sexual brain requires multiple stimuli in, in simultaneously or in quick succession before arousal is triggered. Another fundamental difference between the male sexual brain and the female sexual brain, the male sexual brain physical arousal and psychological arousal are united. So if a man is physically turned on, it's a pretty safe bet he's mentally turned on as well. Not the case in women. The female brain is designed to separate physical arousal and psychological arousal. So a woman can be physically turned on but mentally turned off, which is something that many men find a bit uh, baffling, but uh, it's a common phenomenon. So uh, this evolved over time, apparently, to help protect women from cruel, sneaky, and incompetent men that have, they've been faced with uh, over the eons. So these are two basic differences between the male and female sexual brain, the way they process the cues. The male sexual brain is an OR gate. The female sexual brain is an AND gate. The male sexual brain, psychological and physical arousal are linked, they're detached, uh, in the female sexual brain harder to get them, uh, takes more work to get them to come together in the female brain than in the male brain. So these are some of the basic elements of our Q theory of sexual desire. Now I'm going to take what we've learned to apply it to uh, Edward Cullen and Shino porn. So the reason uh, Q theory can explain both uh, uh, Edward Cullen and Shino porn is they're both examples of erotical illusions, what we call erotical illusions. So let me explain to you what an erotical illusion is. Computational neuroscientists love to analyze optical illusions, and these are two optical illusions that uh, in my, my department we analyze, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out. Because optical illusions reveal the software or visual perception. Uh, uh, optical illusion, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So like on the one on the left, that's what's called an Ehrenstein disk. You see a brighter white disk, a bright white button in the center. Uh, here you see an illusory triangle. Uh, the triangle seems to pop out. So these are things, these are inputs that are tricking the brain into seeing things that aren't quite there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, no, nothing is moving, but if uh, you stare at it, it looks like things along the periphery are moving. This is tricking uh, the uh, movement perception, the movement software, movement perception software uh, of the visual cortex. Uh, and these work by combining different visual cues in novel ways, different geometric and, and color cues, in novel combinations in ways that kind of trick out the software designed for visual perception. The most, let's see, uh, that's the Mona Lisa, uh, very dim, unfortunately. Um, the most popular of optical illusion uh, in all of art is probably Mona Lisa's smile, which you can, can't see too well here. Uh, Mona Lisa's smile, famous for being enigmatic, mysterious. 
Uh, and the reason it's so uh, bewitching and enigmatic is because Leonardo da Vinci painted it an optical illusion. Uh, it was first figured out by Margaret Livingston. She's a computational neuroscientist at Harvard. So our brain processes high resolution information separately from low resolution information. There's two separate circuits. Uh, in our phobia, in the center of our retina, we process high resolution information, and that gets sent down one circuit. In the periphery of our vision, we process low resolution information. So if you look at the mouth uh, of Mona Lisa, if you look directly at the mouth, it seems calm, uh, calm and tranquil. But as soon as you look away to her forehead and eyes, I'm sorry this is not, uh, uh, not brighter, uh, as soon as you look away from the mouth, it looks like she's smiling uh, and teasing. And the reason is, Leonardo da Vinci painted it so the high resolution version of her mouth is flat. Her mouth is almost a horizontal line. But the low resolution goes up to the cheekbones and it's kind of a grin like uh, the Joker in the Batman. Uh, very strong grin. So the brain's simultaneously processing these in different streams in the brain. One, one stream is saying it's smiling, one stream is saying it's not, and that gives it this magical uh, enigmatic quality. Again, it's by combining two separate visual cues in this new way, kind of tricks the brain. So that's something very similar to what's happening uh, with the sexual brain with an erotic illusion. Erotic illusion combines different sexual cues in new combinations to, to trick out the sexual brain. So let me talk about shemale porn. Again, this is very popular among uh, heterosexual men. Gay men are not interested uh, in shemale porn. This was a surprise when we, from, when we went into this, we had no idea uh, that shemale porn was going to be so popular. Obviously, this is something that men aren't comfortable uh, talking about, but the data is uh, quite overwhelming about that, that this is uh, universally popular, massively popular. So why are straight men so interested in uh, she porn. And this actually has clinical uh, implications too. I've been talking with uh, sex therapists as a result of our research, and sex therapists have had no idea what an interest in this meant. Uh, one of the fear, fears that wives of men had when they discovered this on their, on their husband's uh, uh, browsers was that maybe their husband's gay, uh, and the clinicians had no idea if that was true or not, or no way to think about it. So we think the answer is no. Uh, there's nothing gay about liking female porn. It's an erotical illusion. It combines the female uh, anatomical cues that we talked about, breasts, butt, uh, feet, all the curves of a female body, with the other cue of a penis, which we now see the penis is a cue that triggers sexual interest in men. And it combines them into a single gestalt. If you talk to fans of female porn, they usually say something like, oh, she's very beautiful, she's very lovely, and there's an extra something that just pops out in my brain. I can't really describe it. And it's always a sense of the inexplicable when they talk about it. There's something magical and strange. I, I don't really know what's going on. It's very similar to the way people talk about the Mona Lisa smile and about optical illusions, too. Uh, there's just a sense that there's something that they can't quite put their finger on, even though there is something they definitely can put their finger on. <laughs> we know that this is a visual uh, tricking of the brain and not something more psychological because as we even see here at first it was all actual trans shemale porn consisted all of transsexuals oh and I should say please don't call your transsexual friends shemales shemale is a derogatory term uh, it implies that you're working in the sex industry so shemale is a standard term within the adult industry but you shouldn't use that with any transsexual friend it does not work in the adult industry um, shemale porn was originally all human transsexuals live transsexuals but eventually, erotic artists started drawing transsexuals, uh, started drawing females, and that made it very clear exactly what men were interested in, because the art was exactly all of the female, uh, all of the sexual cues for men uh, that they find arousing. Young women, busty, small feet, uh, uh, butts, here's some more uh, erotic female art. Hard to see, but that might not be so bad. Um, young women, High school girls in school outfits, a lot like anime, but always with a very large package uh, down below. Just It's the specific visual elements that arouse a man. In fact, pornographers have recently learned that they don't even need to use actual transsexuals. What they've done now is they use women, usually buxom women, and have them wear very realistic strap-on penises. And then there's websites devoted to uh, this. There's one site called Futnari.com that was the first to do this and became very popular. So 
by having real women with realistic but fake penises, they don't have to get actual transsexuals to do it, uh, but men are still interested, showing that there's not some underlying psychological thing going on. It's this pure visual trickery of the male sexual brain. So what's interesting about erotical illusions is an erotical illusion for a man does not work on women, and erotical illusions for women does not work on men. So imagine for a second the opposite, uh, opposite of the female, maybe a man with a bald head, big muscles, tats all over, a cigar, and a vagina. So there is, there is such a actor, oh gosh, hard to see. But, um, this is Buck Angel, the most popular and perhaps the only porn star uh, who is a female to male transsexual. Uh, it's hard to see, but he does have muscles, tats all over his body, smoking a cigar, he's got a bald head, a beard, uh, and he still has uh, his vagina. So heterosexual women do not show sexual interest in Buck Angel. There is a group of people that are very sexually interested in Buck Angel, and that's gay men, which is what we would predict from Q theory. Gay men are interested in Buck Angel, heterosexual women uh, Aren't. There may be some out there. We did a, a brief survey and weren't able to, to come up with any. And the traffic to Buck Angel sites, there's no women uh, visiting uh, Buck Angel's porn sites. So let's look at the erotical illusion for women. Edward Cullen is a vampire. He's a vampire in Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series of novels. Over the past decade, paranormal romance, as a subgenre of romance novels, has just exploded. Uh, it's the most popular kind of romance novels now, paranormal romance, dominated by authors like Stephanie Meyer, uh, Laurel Hamilton, Charlene Harris, who wrote the True Blood, the series of True Bloods based upon uh, J.R. Ward, uh, many others, many, many authors, many books uh, about paranormal romance. They feature heroes who are supernatural, vampires, werewolves, wizards, uh, things like that. Definitely the king uh, of paranormal romance is the character of Edward Cullen. So he is an erotical illusion, a female erotical illusion, because he combines a number of different female psychological cues into this novel concoction. For example, he's 100 years old, so he's experienced, he's confident, he's confident, but he's in the body of a hot teenager. So he combines the experience and maturity, which men are attracted to, with a hot young body. He is all the girls at the high school where he goes are very interested in, in him, but he shows no, he pays no attention to all the girls at high school. He only pays attention to the heroine of the series, Bella. He is the ultimate alpha male. Whenever human boys, mere human boys, bully uh, his girlfriend, Bella, he can swoop in, literally swoop in, and <laughs> beat the crap out of all of them uh, without uh, breaking a sweat. In fact, he is also an alpha among alphas because he is pretty dominant among other vampires. Uh, as well. So he's an ultimate alpha male. Uh, so all of these, and there's, there's, there's a few more. Uh, the great thing about paranormal romance, and the reason it's exploded, in my opinion, is because it allows female authors to manipulate uh, all these cues in new ways to exaggerate certain qualities. Oh, and another really important one. Uh, so uh, Edward Cullen uh, lusts after Bella. Uh, with a powerful desire because he lusts after her blood. He's a vampire, he wants to drink her blood, so he's got this powerful, overwhelming attraction to her, but he proves his love to her by never giving into it. So it's almost an adolescent female fantasy because he's always desiring her, endlessly, powerfully desiring, but he always holds off. So it's endless desire without consummation. Though, I point out, people think that it's just adolescence interest in this. No, uh, women, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, we saw many women in their, in their mid to late 40s who are just absolutely sexually obsessed with uh, Edward Cullen, so this is not just something that appeals uh, to younger women. The reverse of this is not true. Men are not interested, uh, for the most part, in Twilight novels or similar novels, and uh, romantic erotic stories about uh, female vampires, uh, there isn't any that has broken out uh, among men. Men are not, uh, don't find this uh, particularly interesting. So there's many, many other erotical illusions. I'll just mention a few uh, that people often want to hear about. Uh, facials, facials, which uh, women 
uh, for the most part, find disgusting. Uh, we know that from, we talked to some of the female erotic sites, and they always have surveys about what women want to see in uh, erotic videos, and facials is always at the very bottom of the list. For men, it's usually at the top of the list. Why are men interested in it? It's an erotical illusion. It combines psychological cues with visual cues in ways uh, that aren't possible with any other uh, place. Uh, they're almost like emoticons expressing emotion, having an emotional connection with the visual moment. Uh, another, this is a human toria, another erotic illusion for men. Uh, this one's not so common, but it, it kind of reveals the nature of so erotic trickery. Another erotic illusion for women is slash fiction. Slash is a subgenre. I shouldn't even say subgenre because it's almost, uh, it's really just about as big as fan fiction, uh, but the parts of fan fiction that aren't slash. Um, slash fiction are stories about two men, usually two strong, uh, dominant, masculine men, who share their emotional side with each other, fall in love, and have sex. Not always have sex. Having the emotional sharing is the important part, just like it is in a romance novel. Here's a representation of Slash with Edward Cullen, the vampire, and Jacob Black, the werewolf, from uh, Twilight. Very popular um, pairing within Slash fiction. This is uh, erotic illusion for women. It combines, the reason women read romance novels is because they're stories of men revealing their tender side, their emotional side, of strong dominant revealing the tender side. So this just basically doubles up all the, cue, the cues. This is analogous to men like looking at lesbian porn to women making out and kissing regardless of their personalities and character. Uh, in slash fiction, the emotions of the two men, uh, the revealing emotion, the sharing uh, their secret parts with each other, that's always the focus. The sex is in there too. Uh, sometimes, depending on the author, but it's always the emotional connection. Slash is very emotional. Uh, you'd never make mistake slash fiction for erotica written by a gay man. Uh, so these are some erotical illusions, and one thing worth considering is just how different uh, these are. Just how different Edward Cullen is from Shima porn, or the human toria is from slash fiction. Just the male and female sexual brain, and down at the most basic operation. We're talking, of course, now just it's fundamental level. I'm not talking about sexual relationships, which are far more uh, compl complex and complicated. But just at the basic level of how our sexual brains work, the male and the female brain uh, are very, very different. And, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm curious about, um, so for example, you said that, uh, uh, let's say she, the she-male porn uh, was of interest to heterosexual men. How can you tell that from the kind of data that you're able to collect? Uh, sure. Like billing data or whatever. So the, the most prominent way is we talk to people that run uh, she-male sites, and we talk to she-male porn stars, and they say their fans are heterosexual men uh, from interacting with them. There was actually an academic study that went into a shemale bar in Chicago and interviewed the men there to ask their sexual preference. And I think about 70% were straight men and 30% were bisexuals and there were no gay men at the bar. Also from search histories, if you look at search, search histories, people that search for shemale porn either search for uh, heterosexual stuff in, in addition or bisexual stuff. There's not uh, any clear indication of somebody searching for shemale and gay porn. There's a, once in a while, but it's very rare compared to sh somebody searching for shemale porn and you know hot teens, uh, for example. Um, so, in these uh, in these videos, the shemale usually the uh, like interacting with the male or interacting with the female, and does that have an effect on like whether bi men watch it or straight men watch it? There may. So we haven't. That's something we haven't disentangled the point. We we mainly try to look at uh, just the images themselves. Mm -hmm. But you're right. There's some shemale porn, they're having sex with men. Some shemale porn, they're having sex with other shemales. And what the, who those different variations appeal to, we didn't, we didn't uh, look at that yet. But probably bisexu bisexuals are probably interested in the interaction. Whereas a lot of, a lot of shemale erotica now is just images like those images I showed you. So we would, I would speculate that you can see a difference between what straight men and bisexual men are uh, interested in, but we don't know. Are there any like cultural settings? Like for example, I mean, Japan's part of the city. Yes. And then like also if you look at a lot of Asian like 
Yes. And if you look at their idols and all the guys, they're really girly looking boys. Yes. So I want to talk about Japan. Um, one important thing about Japan is, so internet came up, there was erotic art from all around the world, and Japanese erotic art has just dominated the internet. Uh, because, uh, in our opinion, they do the basic visual cues that interest men uh, the best. An anime girl, uh, young, busty, round butt, uh, curvy, small feet, high-pitched voice, all the cues, biological cues that interest men across cultures. Uh, we think that's why Japanese anime has just crushed all other erotic art. And there's actually erotic art in just about every country in the world, but only Japanese uh, erotic art rose uh, to, to universal uh, popularity. Also, another interesting cultural uh, difference. So I talked about the four body parts that are universal, breast, butt, feet, and penises. Um, but depending on the culture, other body parts are also interesting. So in Japan, for example, they're very interested, men are very interested in something called the absolute territory, which is a strip of thigh here below a skirt and above a thigh high stocking. Uh, very popular, uh, was like the most popular fetish for a while, might still be, uh, when we were doing our research, it was the most popular fetish, the, the, the absolute territory. In India, the belly, the stomach, is an erogenous zone. Lots of searches for bellies uh, in India, probably because they present the belly uh, as an erotic interest. Uh, in Victorian England, supposedly, the ankle was considered very erotic. So there is cultural variability in even what a man, uh, the anatomical parts a man's attracted to, but breast, butt, feet, and uh, penises do seem uh, to be universal. And in Japan, uh, another interesting thing about Japan for, for the women is there's probably greatest comfort with reading gay stories, stories about two gay men among heterosexual women in Japan. Uh, very popular and usually uh, Comic books or TV shows uh, will put out a special uh, slash version, the gay, the gay version of the characters, even if they're not gay in the actual original series, to appeal to this. Um, but uh, there's much more comfort comfort among uh, girls and women in Japan reading uh, stories about uh, two men falling in love uh, as well, and often having more feminized uh, boys uh, in some of these stories as well. And yeah, you talked about the work, the last major study being done, uh, being Alfred Kinsey. Yes. Where does the work of Masters and Johnsons in the 60s and 70s fit in? They focused on the physiology of sex. Okay. On, they had people come into the lab and had sex and watched like anatomical changes, uh, things like that. They focused on the actual physical process of uh, intercourse rather than what turned people on. Though they did, one finding, uh, that we thought was pretty interesting is they, and based on what they saw, and this, this is a bit subjective, it has to be subjective, they think gay people have better sex than straight people, that gay people have more satisfying sex. When they had gay couples in the lab, they always uh, reported greater sexual times, and they seemed to be more comfortable and have a better time uh, than men and women. So there might be some sexual benefit to sharing the same sexual cues uh, with somebody else. Perhaps it's just a greater familiarity with the anatomy. Uh, it's not clear exactly. What, what that might be, but other surveys too that have asked about sexual satisfaction tend to find that gay people find sex more uh, satisfying. But yeah, Masters and Johnson focused on the physiology, not not on. They didn't look at, you know, are, do, are people attracted to, you know, animals or, or she knows or things like that. You mentioned the four body parts, and then you mentioned also the popularity of lesbian porn, which seems to go. Yeah, I mean, there is one missing body part. Clearly. The, the, the vagina? No, you said, you know, four body part, you know, breasts, um, bottom, penis, which is obviously missing in this lesbian porn. So why is that still very popular? Oh, you don't need all the cues. It, remember, any single cue. Oh, it's an or. Yeah, any You're single right. cue is enough. It's just right here, the rest and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Go to completion, let's say. There's very rare women that can look at a man's chest and nothing else and you know, manage to get to you. So you talked about uh, gay and straight men. Yes. Um, what did you find out about lesbians? We did not focus on lesbians uh, as much, unfortunately. We only wanted to report results if we could talk to actual fans of the erotica. So we talked to a lot of gay men. In fact, I personally watched a whole lot of gay porn with my 
gay friends just to get familiar with it. Uh, and for the shemale porn, we found people who were fans of that. Uh, but the truth was, we tried to approach lesbians, but they were always uncomfortable sharing their sexual reaction and sexual experiences uh, with us. I'm a heterosexual man. Uh, we, we wish, I, you know, I have a few lesbian friends, but I wanted to go outside just my friends for that because that's what we did for everything else. But having said that, we can see a few conclusions. What lesbians are interested in uh, is very different from what gay men are interested in. Also, before I say anything, homosexuality in men is almost certainly biological, but you're born gay uh, if you're a man. With women, it's much more uh, ambiguous. Some women are born gay, but women, by their, the nature of their sexuality, can also become lesbian. One reason is because their cues, their sexual cues, are not tied to physicality. They're tied to the emotions. They're tied to the psychology. So like Anne H., uh, she was married to a man. She was an actress. She was married to a man. Then she dated Ellen DeGeneres for a while, and then she went and married another man. Very, very rare to find the opposite, where there's a guy with a uh, marriage woman, he has gay, he's gay for a while and he goes back. Very rare, I don't know if uh, any. Um, but the reason is because female sexuality and lesbian sexuality are much more fluid, much more dynamic. In fact, female sexuality in general is much more fluid and adaptive. Men's sexual interests are formed during adolescence, roughly between ages 12 and 22, roughly, uh, and then they're fixed pretty much for life. When a guy likes at age 20, is almost certainly what he's going to be liking at age 40. Not the case with women. Women's sexuality is designed to be fluid, flexible, adaptive. What a woman likes at age 20 might be very different than what she likes uh, at age 40. Uh, and the reason is, the reason for this fundamental difference is because the information men and women need to determine a good sexual partner is very different. For a man, what he's interested in is a healthy body, a body that can uh, have children. And so a single glance provides enough basic information to know is the woman healthy and capable of having uh, children. And that doesn't change. What's a healthy woman when a guy's young is the same as what a healthy woman is when he's 40. But for a woman, she needs a man who's going to be committed, who's going to stick around, uh, who's going to be kind to her and her kids, uh, who's going to be competent enough that he can take care of her and provide for her. And the kind of man that is capable of doing that does change. It changes from culture to culture. It changes from age to age. Um, so a woman needs to be a little more flexible. Also, that's another reason why women are so interested in the opinions of other women, because to determine what makes a good man is a much more difficult project, much more complicated project. We say in our book, and, and I believe this, uh, the female brain is more sophisticated than the male brain, because it has to do more sophisticated long-term planning. Uh, it has to figure out if a guy is going to be good over a long period of time, uh, which requires a lot more if you're writing a computer program, if you're writing robot, creating robots for a male brain and a female brain, it would be much, much harder to program uh, the female brain than the male brain. Well, what's special about them? So that surprised us. I mean, we've all heard of foot fetishes, but, uh, uh, and before we did our research, there was no co conventional wisdom about it. No, there was no theory about why men were interested in feet. It wasn't even known how popular uh, it was, but it turns out very popular in every culture. Also, both gay men and straight men. One of the theories about feet had been that since women wear fancy shoes and uh, high heels, that attracts the men's attention to it. But of course, gay men uh, aren't attracted to it. Men are wearing uh, fancy shoes, and gay men are just as interested. But there's also a study, a guy went into some pre-literate cultures in Iran, Brazil, New Guinea, cultures that aren't on the internet, and uh, found out in all cultures, men are always interested in smaller than average feet, smaller than average. Women are interested in average size feet, uh, but men are interested in smaller than average feet in all cultures. And that's what we see in online foot erotica too. The feet are almost always uh, smaller. The reason we think all of the body parts that men are attracted to uh, are connected with estrogen. Estrogen uh, indicates a woman's health and fertility uh, because it, it's connected with her level of energy. So if a woman's not getting enough nutrition, uh, and if she's not getting enough health, her estrogen levels drop. And if her estrogen levels drop, uh, her anatomical parts don't uh, necessarily grow as much as a woman who is getting health uh, and nutrition. So breasts, uh, but they're both uh, connected with estrogen. It turns out estrogen also controls bone growth. It determines when the end of uh, a bone stops growing. 
So estrogen controls the length of the foot, as it turns out. So we th think that that's one, uh, yet another reason why men are interested in feet. It's also the case that when women get pregnant, their feet get larger. So for a man, a pregnant woman would not be a good sexual object because you're not going to be able to reproduce, obviously. So a larger foot would indicate, be an indication of a less likely uh, for a woman uh, to be fertile uh, as well. So there's some biological reasons, I think, to explain it, but uh, this is, our book is the first to really lay this out, so you know, it's going to need some more research from other people. But it's clearly the case men are interested in feet uh, all around the world, like Rex Ryan, coach of the New York Jets. <laughs> Uh, what about the kink communities? What? The kink communities. So, uh, do you have any particular in mind? Uh, <laughs> BDS is a good place to start. What's that? BDSM? BDSM. So, BDSM, uh, so there are many, we now know, before, the, before we did the research, it wasn't known the popularity of different kinks. It was just all uh, guessing. Uh, now we actually have from our research, clear idea of what kinks are common and what are common. Uh, so now we know shemale porn, for example, common. BDSM, also very common. We think what's going on behind BDSM, so this is something very new that is not in the research before we did ours, uh, not in the literature. Um, one of the most fundamental aspects of human sexuality in the male and female brain is dominance and submission. We all come wired to prefer dominance or submission. This basic fact explains so much erotica, male erotica and female erotica, that it's absolutely not mentioned at all anywhere in the scientific literature. But from our research, it became very clear. So BDSM is a piece of that, but so much male pornography uh, is determined whether it's dominant, it's showing a man dominating a woman, or is it a man getting dominated by the woman? So uh, it appears that the majority of heterosexual men come born, come wired to prefer sexual dominance, to be on to be the one to be on top. A minority of men, a very large minority of men, however, come wired to be sexually submissive. They prefer submissive uh, porn. Uh, this reflects what we see in rats and chimpanzees, too. It turns out in the rat brain and the chimpanzee brain, we've identified there's a part of the brain that controls sexual dominance, and there's a part of the brain that controls sexual submission. But the fascinating thing is that both the dominance and submission parts of the brain are in everybody. They're in both males and females. So it appears to be the case in humans as well that we all come with the ability to be sexually dominant or sexually submission, but one of them gets wired up. Interestingly, gay men, gay men much more likely to be sexually submissive. A majority of gay men are likely to be sexually submissive. A majority of straight men are likely to be sexually dominant. In fact, the only difference, the only difference we could find between gay sexuality and straight sexuality, besides the fact that gay men like men and straight men like women. The only difference is that gay men are more likely to enjoy sexual submission and straight men are more likely to enjoy sexual domination. In every other way, gay pornography and straight pornography, absolutely indistinguishable. Gay interests and gay behaviors online, absolutely indistinguishable uh, from straight men. They do not behave like, gay men do not behave like women online uh, at all. They behave even more like men uh, than straight men do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, I think we'll go ahead and um, sign some books and sure. feel free to uh, chat and do it. Thank you. Thank you.